The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Let's get started. We want to wrap up today our discussion of atoms without external field and then discuss what happens when we put atoms into external magnetic fields. Last class, we talked about isotope shifts and there was the question, how big are those isotopes for some of your favorite atoms? And uh, I just uh, looked up some information on lithium, which is a light atom. And uh, this paper here, shows calculations compared with experiments. Uh, the isotope shift between lithium-6 and lithium-7 due to the mass, lithium-6 and lithium-7, is about 10 gigahertz. The volume effect is only 2 megahertz, 1,000 times smaller. However, the precision of experiments is such that if you find an isotope shift, the mass effect can be exactly calculated from the atomic masses. You can still get information about the size of the atomic nucleus out of it. So this is the example of a light atom, 10 gigahertz mass effect, 2 megahertz volume effect. And here is the rubidium atom. The isotope shift of the D1 line between 85 and 87 is 77 megahertz only. The mass shift is 56 megahertz, and the remainder is mainly the volume effect. There's a specific mass effect due to electronic correlations if you have multiple electrons, which I think is small here, but I don't want to discuss it. So we can now compare the mass effect in rubidium versus lithium. First of all, uh, the shift compared to infinite mass, the reduced mass effect, is much bigger in lithium. It's 20 times bigger in lithium than in rubidium. However, when you go from lithium-6 to lithium-7, the mass changes by 15%. So the delta M over M is also much larger for lithium than rubidium. And if you add those two factors, you find that the mass effect is 200 times larger in lithium, 10 gigahertz versus 50 megahertz. And the nuclear volume effect is 2 megahertz for lithium, 20 megahertz for rubidium. So that sets the scale. Any question about that? OK. Uh, let me come back to one other question which we discussed. Uh, last class. And this was the question about uh, if you have a deformation of a nucleus, or if you have an, any kind of anisotropic shape of an object, uh, what is the minimum angular momentum in order to observe it? And I know a lot of you got confused about it. So I want to discuss uh, the same thing again, but by now focusing on two different frames, the lab frame and the body fixed frame. And I hope you find this discussion insightful. Okay, today is the fifth. So let's assume we have an object. It can be a molecule. Actually, we have a homework assignment whether you can observe the permanent dipole moment of a molecule. And this will lead you into a discussion of lab frame versus body fixed frame. So, But let's assume we have an object 
assume it's a nucleus, which has a really odd shape. However, if, you, if it has angular momentum of zero, all you have is one length. If you have an angular momentum of one half, you have two levels, and you can now define in the laboratory that the energy difference is due to the magnetic dipole moment, for instance, or the electric dipole moment if you put in electric field. If you have I equals one, you can have three levels, E1, E0, E minus 1. And let's say you have put the atoms into an electric field gradient. You can then ask if uh, E0 is in the middle between up and down plus one or minus one, or whether it's displaced or not. And depending whether this is larger or smaller than zero, uh, you would say there is a quadrupole moment which is larger or smaller than zero. In other words, what I'm telling you is, you, if you have only one level, i equals zero, you can't say anything about the shape of the object. If you have two levels, you can determine a dipole moment. If you have three levels, by the deviation from the equidistancy, uh, you can find a higher order moment. Okay, but now comes the point. If you assume, you can now take two positions. Uh, you can say that for low i, the deformation or the magnetic moment for i equals zero cannot be measured therefore it is zero or you can say uh, deformation exists but only in not in the lab frame but in the body fixed frame so in other words you would say that the deformation exists always it's just a measurement problem at low angular momentum I cannot measure or the other statement would be, well, if you can't measure it in quantum mechanics, it means it doesn't exist. So which statement or which, which conclusion is correct? argument and this is more based on the left. Well, I would say the left frame argument is always correct because you can't measure it, you can't determine it in the left. But let me go from there. Let's assume we have uh, an object and uh, we think it has a deformation but it has a low angular momentum state. Can we still say that in its body fixed frame we have an object which has a deformation or not? Now, my personal opinion is the following. Uh, it really depends. If you have a system where you can add angular momentum without changing the, without changing the internal structure. For instance, if I have this stick, and I can just spin it up. And if I can spin it up, I can get an angular momentum wave packet. I can orient it and measure its deformation. Then I think I would say, even if this state has zero angular momentum, it has a deformation. And the way I know it, because if I add angular momentum, I can measure the deformation. I cannot measure it at low angular momentum. 
So then you would say in the body fixed system there is a deformation, but it only manifests itself in the lab frame if I add angular momentum. However, you may have an object, let's say a molecule, which is so weakly bound that one quantum of angular momentum due to centrifugal forces rips it apart. That exists, extremely bound state, which cannot provide enough uh, binding force to withstand even one unit of angular momentum. So that's an object which you cannot rotate, you cannot transfer any angular momentum without destroying it, without ripping it apart. And now to say that this molecule has a dipole moment or has some anisotropy is like, you know, it's, you're making a statement which cannot be tested at all. So at that point you should rather say what matters is what I can measure in the lab and I will never be able to measure any deformation in the lab. So the first approach with a stick, the first example with a stick will apply to a very stable molecule which may have a di dipole moment and you assume it has the same dipole moment whether it's rotating or not. And then you would say, in, it's at zero angular momentum, I cannot measure the dipole moment, but I know it exists in the body fixed frame. If you have nuclei, uh, if you have a nucleus, and you have sort of a wave function of the protons and neutrons, and it's I equals zero, you will not find any moment. And at least for the ground state of nuclei, when you add angular momentum, you really change the internal structure. You have to promote nucleons to higher orbits. So you cannot add angular momentum and still have the same object. So therefore, you have to say the ground state with I equals zero has no deformation because there is no way to ever find it as deformation. So it doesn't exist. But there are excited state of nuclei which have a deformation and this deformed nuclei can be put into a multiplet of angular momentum states. So then you would see, I, I have the same kind of nucleus, but a different angular momentum states. And at, at higher angular momentum states, you can, with higher accuracy, determine quadrupole moments and, 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 and things like this. And then you may say the same internal state has now a non-rotating state, and you would still be tempted, and you are correct with that, to associate a deformation even in the non-rotating state. I hope those remarks help you to sort of reconcile the two aspects, whether you have an object which is stable enough to be spun up. And then I think you can always talk about the body fixed frame. But if you have an object where you change the internal structure when you add angular momentum, I, I think for fundamental reasons, you cannot associate any deformation with it. Any questions about that? So let me just write down one sentence of a summary. So the, the definition of a deformation in a body fixed frame make sense only if you can add or change angular momentum without significantly changing the internal structure.
the computer is set up, I cannot go backward in the presentation mode. I need to press a key. Okay. Yes. Okay. What I want to discuss next is uh, give you a little bit of a historic summary how spectroscopy of hydrogen has developed. In particular, also focusing on one important discovery, the discovery of QED through the lamp shift. And of course, we all love hydrogen because it's the simplest atom, but it has so much interesting physics in it. So I've summarized for you here some papers on hydrogen, and I use them to illustrate several points. I will show you that actually the discovery of the lamp shift had precursors. Ten years before the lamp shift was discovered, people had even some idea that something may be wrong with the understanding of the structure of hydrogen. So you can say they came so close, people, ten years before, in realizing the lamp shift. Uh, there were people who maybe missed the Nobel Prize by just a tiny little bit. They had all the insight that there may be quantum QED corrections in hydrogen. They just didn't have the technology to measure it accurately enough. The second example I want to show, show is that we always talk about fundamental limitations. But fundamental limitations can disappear in time because they may not be as fundamental as they appear. So for instance, uh, you, uh, uh, there, were, there were limitations in the measurement of the lamp shift because you had a short lifetime of P states. But with the advent of two photon transition, you can go from S to S and S to D uh, states, and therefore map out lamp shifts with much, much higher precision, not limited by, uh, by the finite lifetime of P states. Or finally, you would say lamp shifts are small splittings. And for many, many years, lamp shifts were measured by making radio frequency transitions between two S and two P states. Well, today, the most accurate measurement of the lamp shift is with an optical transition, where you need a much, much higher relative precision to see the tiny lamp shift. But optical metrology with uh, direct frequency measurements and frequency codes has so much improved in precision that now an optical measurement, even if it comes to a tiny difference, is more accurate than a direct eye measurement. So I think the history of hydrogen shows you that technology can completely change the paradigm how measurements are made. Fundamental limits disappear because new tools on the inside is available. And also that sort of I find it interesting that discoveries often have precursors and people have a hunch, know about it, and then finally it is discovered. Let me just step you through some historic papers. So, so this paper is 1933, 15 years before the land shift. And it says that one possible explanation for some discrepancy of the, in the structure of the Balma lines is that the effect of the interaction between the radiation field and the atom has been neglected. That's QED. You cannot just calculate the structure of the hydrogen atom from the Coulomb field. You have to allow the radiation field, all the modes of the vacuum to be included. So this insight is not due to land. It was there already, 1933. Uh, same year, look at the title, on the breakdown of the Coulomb law for the hydrogen atom. People speculated or discussed that the Coulomb law will not be valid at very small distances. This is ultimately what QED, radiative correction, the lamp shift, vacuum polarization, and all that brings about. Uh, yeah, finally, people had an understanding of the hydrogen atom, and they measured, and I want you to sort of keep that in mind, they did optical, uh, they measured uh, uh, the, the Balma lines of hydrogen and deuterium, uh, and uh, 
and, and, and when they, they couldn't fully resolve it because of the finite lifetime of the peak state, but there was some hunch when you try to get the envelope from the underlying structure that there was a discrepancy. It was just not significant enough to say for sure there is an additional line shift which is not accounted for by theory. Um, yes, there was a discussion that there is a deviation of the Coulomb law, but here is the insight, or as was indicated by previous authors, the interaction required to change the Coulomb law at small distances is much too large to be accounted for by the assumption of a finite size of electron and proton. So the Coulomb field has to be modified at short distances in a much stronger way than just the finite size of the proton. We'll talk about the finite size of the proton in a minute. And then, of course, 1947, uh, you know, UIF oscillators have been developed in the pursuit of, of radar. Experimental tools are there now high power RF sources, tunable sources and such, and then Lamp and Rutherford in this landmark paper look at the fine structure of the hydrogen atom. And this is the famous result. They measure transitions as a function of magnetic field. And uh, you see the solid line, which I think was the theory. Without the lamp shift, the dashed line is the hyperfine structure of hydrogen and the lines converge, and the difference is uh, 1,000 megacycles, the first determination of the lamp shift. So this was uh, 1947. It's interesting that it's just one or two weeks later, there is a theoretical paper by Hans Bethe providing an explanation for the lamp shift. So already coming up with the first uh, model how to uh, account for QED. I didn't look it up in detail, but I, but I thought the spirit was similar to what I presented you in class, that the electromagnetic zero-point energy is shaking the electron uh, and, and leading to corrections. But it's amazing that within weeks, well, theorists figure really out, yes, this is the explanation, this is how we have to extend the theory. For a number, uh, for a number of years, um, People pursued measurements of the lamp shift with higher and higher accuracy. I just like the last uh, sentence here. This is now the next paper by Willis Lamp and Rutherford. And they are sort of saying that they wanted to measure the lamp shift with higher precision, but then they said the program was large, encountered unexpected difficulties, which required much more time to surmount. As a result, the paper promised two years ago was delayed. I think this applies to many, many papers to be written, but here the authors even say that up front it took us sort of two years longer to, longer to do the research than we initially anticipated. So, uh, you see now the growing accuracy. Uh, we have the lamp shift, which is on the order of 1,000 megacycles, 1 gigahertz, and the precision is now in the 100 kilohertz range. This was the technology, the, the technology of the original discovery. Then there was a next generation of experiments on the lamp shift using uh, separated oscillatory fields, Ramsey techniques. Uh, we'll talk about the data in the course. And with these techniques, uh, the accuracy of the lamp shift is now in the uh, one digit further in the uh, 10 kilohertz regime. There is a nice feature that we'll also discuss it later that it was possible to obtain a line width which is subnatural. We talk about it later that it's possible to do spectroscopy on unstable states, which provides a line, uh, a line width narrow, narrower than the natural line width. If you want to get one sentence, but as an appetizer, you just look at the atoms which have not decayed for a long time, and if you play some tricks, you can then get a line width, which is several lifetimes, which corresponds to several lifetimes, and not just to the one over the lifetime. 
but it's not. But, but there are some conditions have to be met, and those authors use that here to, to advantage to narrow the line for the measurement of the lamp shift. Yes. So uh, the abstract says that the result is not in good agreement with theory. What was the theoretical? How far had it? Oh, I don't know. I don't know it at this point. I will later give you a comparison with the UV, which is highly accurate. So this was more some. I assume at this point. I'm not sure if it was experimental difficulty. I didn't trace down what what they meant in the abstract. Um, So these are the same authors, just a few years later, the agreement between theory and experiment is at the two standard deviations. So, so I think this problem disappeared. And I don't know if it was the fault of theory or experiment. Uh, but now we go a step forward to the optical spectroscopy. You remember, originally, and this is why the lamp chip was not jumping into people's eye when they did uh, spectroscopy of the Balmer spectrum of hydrogen, you cannot resolve the structure, so you cannot, the lamp shift is there, but it's hidden in the envelope of the unresolved lines. And now, the advent of lasers, and people immediately develop saturation spectroscopy, that's how most of our laboratories stabilize their lasers using Doppler-free saturation spectroscopy. And when saturation spectroscopy was invented by Hinch and Charlo, Charlo, for the first time you can break through the Doppler bits, and now you see the lines reverse, resolve. And here, I think for the first time, you see two peaks separated, and the splitting is the lamp shift, which until then was only accessible through radio frequency methods. Of course, these were the first lasers, just pulsed lasers, and. Uh, couldn't even think about precision. Uh, but then, of course, using metrology, using frequency chains, people could measure, uh, could do precision measurements in the optical domain. And uh, these are now papers in the 90s, optical measurement on the lamp shift in the ground state, not only in the excited state. Uh, Talking about the comparison with experimental theory, so experimentalists pushed to higher and higher precision, and suddenly there was a discrepancy. And uh, it was a discrepancy in the 1S lamp shift. In the 1S state, the lamp shift is much bigger than in the 2 state, uh, because the electron interacts you know, much more intimately with the origin where the Coulomb potential is strongest. And people found that the experiment did no longer agree with theory. But then the theorists had to you know, check all their assumptions. And it was found that there are some two-loop binding corrections, which were surprisingly large. I mean, often you make an estimate that those terms are small. But you, you say it's higher order, but you may not know the prefactor. And here, something was surprisingly large. And by now improving the theory, there was again agreement between experiment and theory. It's getting now down to the kilohertz level. And uh, at least as a few years ago, this was sort of state of the art. Remember, the lamp shift is about 1,000 megacycles, 1 gigahertz. And now the precision is in the semen kilohertz. And as I pointed out, precision was reached by uh, directly measuring the frequency of lasers, frequency metrology. Uh, this was actually, for historic interest, frequency metrology. They used beat nodes between some, uh, between the laser used to measure the hydrogen line and some other lasers. So this is just a few years before. Uh, comb generators, frequency combs, completely change things again. But they had already the precision of a direct frequency measurement. Well, you can read about it when I post it. It shows you sort of what the error budget is in those measurements. This is a slide I borrowed from Ted Hench, Optical Spectroscopy of Hydrogen. It just sort of shows the advances in frequency metrology. And it shows how it shows that how cesium clocks and optical spectroscopy, how they have changed in precision. And eventually, we, we are now 
past the time where uh, optical spectroscopy is more accurate than microwave and radio frequency spectroscopy. Optical clocks are more accurate than the CC frequency standards. And I'm sure in, in your lifetime you will experience the redefinition of the same because the CC clock is no longer accurate enough compared with the most precise optical measurements. And I think there was a big gap, a change in slope here. In the old days, you measured uh, the wavelengths of light by making a measurement of the wavelengths using maybe a grading or interferometry. But when you now started to measure frequencies directly, then there was a change in slope and major improvements in precision. And today, of course, the most precise measurements of uh, of laser frequencies is not through the wavelengths directly count the number of cycles in a beat node with an optical cone generator. So what can you do with ever increasing precision? That's uh, also a slide I borrowed from Ted Hinge. Uh, if you have, if you measure very, very accurately uh, a line, an atomic line, let's say the 1s, 2s uh, transition in hydrogen using two photon spectroscopy, what you can do is you can measure it, and a few years later you can measure it again. And now it becomes an interesting question if you have this precision, will the result be the same as a function of time? If there were a small change, which there wasn't, you would actually, you could only come to one conclusion, and this is fundamental constants in nature change as a function of time. So this precision of metrology is now being used to test whether fundamental constants are really constant as a function of time. Uh, precision is even more improving. The latest in the development of the spectroscopy of hydrogen is what is called the size of the proton puzzle. In your homework assignment, you are actually calculating what is the correction due to transition frequencies in hydrogen because you don't have a Coulomb field of a point particle, the proton has a finite size. Or vice versa, if you have sufficient prediction, if you have sufficient accuracy of the measurement, you can determine the size of the proton from the measured transition frequencies. And this was done and in 2010, there was a big surprise that the size of the proton determined from hydrogen spectroscopy did not agree with scattering measurements where you scatter, I think, electrons or protons to measure the proton size. So this is still a puzzle. It's called the proton radius puzzle, and it is not clear what, what is causing it. What happened is in 2010 that there was a big improvement in measuring the size of the proton. And this was done by replacing the electron with a muon, which is a heavy electron. But since the muon is so much heavier, the Bohr orbit of the muon, the negative particle going around the proton, uh, is much smaller. And therefore, the Lenz, uh, so, so, sorry, therefore, the uh, well, the lamp shift also, but all, but also the correction due to the finite size of the proton is much, much larger because there is much more overlap of the muonic wave function with, uh, uh, with the proton and for the electron. So there was a huge improvement in the precision of the measurement of the proton size, and this has really led to what is called the proton radius puzzle. And it's not sure if that is at the same level of the lamp shift, which gave rise to fundamental new physics. Maybe this is the, lamp the discovery of a new lamp shift in 2010, and it changes our understanding of uh, fundamental physics. But maybe it's something else. The answer is not there. At least, pre at least this is 2010. A few years of checking the theory and checking the experiment has not removed the discrepancy. Rather to the contrary, it has hardened that there is that there is some discrepancy which needs to be resolved. Okay, so this was just sort of a little shot of 
the excursion was a little bit of summary of spectroscopy of hydrogen over 80 years from precursors to the lamp shift to the proton radius puzzle. Colin. So I know the same group um, was doing, was using the same technique to measure like deuterium, maybe helium. I think they want to do it, but they haven't done they it. Haven't that's done that's it. what they plan to do. are now atoms in external magnetic fields. And the first chapter is on structure and the language factor. Uh, but maybe more colloquially, atoms in external fields means that we add one more vector to the mix. In fine structure, we had orbital angular momentum and spin angular momentum, and we discussed how spin-orbit coupling eventually couples L and S to J and so on. But now we extend the game by one more vector B, an external magnetic field. And it really becomes sort of a player in the game because you know that if you have spin-orbit coupling, we use the vector model that L and S couple and precess around the axis of J, the total angular momentum. So this so the game we played when we couple angular momentum is that angular momentum couple, they precess around an axis that involves new quantum numbers and so on. But now we can add a new axis, quantization axis to the magnetic field, and then angular momenta will precess around the magnetic field. And there may be actually a conflict that for strong magnetic field, uh, the precession is different than at weak magnetic fields. And this is what we want to discuss now. So it is the game of L, S, and B. So what we are adding with magnetic fields is we are adding one term to the Hamiltonian, which is the Zeeman term, where we have an external magnetic field. Uh, and we couple with a magnetic moment. So the, the one thing which makes it interesting when we discuss fine structure is the following. That uh, we have actually two components to the angular momentum of the atom, which is the spin and the orbital angular momentum. And the two have different g factors. So it's not that angular momentum, that the magnetic moment is just proportional to the angular momentum. If the angular momentum comes from spin, it has a different weight than when the angular momentum comes from orbital angular momentum. And this is what we want, what, what we want to now understand. Uh, what, what is, we want to understand, uh, we want to determine what is the magnetic moment of the atom when the angular momentum has two different sources. And what we will find is, we will find that there is a Landy G factor, which is sometimes two, which is sometimes one, or which is sometimes has a value in between, depending how S and L are arranged with respect to each other. So our Hamiltonian is the Hamiltonian for the atom. We know that we have fine structure. We discussed that, which couples L and S. Uh, and now we 
has the momentum and that couples to the external magnetic field. So in other words, if we had no fine structure coupling, if S and L would not be coupled, the answer would be very simple. S just couples to the magnetic field, gives the same effect to the G factor of 2, and L couples and, uh, and, gives a, and couples to the magnetic field with a G factor of 1. But now the two are coupled with respect to each other, and if we have LS coupling, the projection of S and L on the z-axis is not a good quantum number anymore. So therefore, we have two different terms which, have, which, which are diagonal in two different bases. And that's what we want to discuss. OK, so the g factor of orbital angular momentum is 1. The g factor of the spin is 2. or if you want to include the leading correction due to QED, it's the five structure constant over two, over two pi. Okay, we did discuss that the fine structure can be related as the Zeeman energy of the spin in a magnetic field which is created by the electron due to its motion. Or if you take the frame of the electron, the electron sees the proton orbiting around that creates a magnetic field, and this magnetic field couples to the spin. So therefore, we can associate fine structure with an internal magnetic field inside the atom. And this internal magnetic field is rather large. It's on the order of one Tesla. So therefore, for our discussion of uh, the Landy G factor and fine structure and applied magnetic fields, we will assume that we are in the weak field limit, where the fine structure term, the first term, is much larger than the Zeeman term. Of course, if you use very strong magnets, you can go to the high field case, but I will discuss explicitly the transition from weak field to high field for hyperfine structure. And the, and the phenomenon for fine structure is completely analogous. It just happens at much higher fields. So anyway, I will discuss the high field case and transition to the high field case with a much more, rele with a much more relevant example of hyperfine structure. And you can immediately apply to fine structure if you want. Okay, so if I wanted to calculate, if I want to solve the problem, uh, calculate the Landy G factor, I could directly calculate just one matrix element and it would be done. So all I want to know is what is the Zeeman energy? And the Zeeman energy divided by the magnetic field is the magnetic moment. And I can, and, and since I assume that I'm in the weak field limit, I can simply use the quantum numbers S, L, and S and L coupled to J. And the magnetic quantum number is MJ. So by simply calculating this expectation value, I'm done, and I've solved the problem. Uh, this is how 
However, I want to do the derivation using the vector model because it provides some additional insight. So in the vector model, we have L and S. L and S cover to J to the total angular momentum. So L, and in the vector model, we assume that L and S rapidly precess around J. And therefore, the only thing which matters are the projection, only the projections of L and S uh, on the J axis are important. So you can say if you have a rapid precession of L and S around J, the transverse components rapidly average out and do not contribute. So therefore, our Zeeman Hamiltonian has to be rewritten in the following way. The Zeeman Hamiltonian was the magnetic moment times the external magnetic field with a minus sign. Uh, but what matters are only the what matters is the projection on the J direction so we do the projection in this way and also in the end what matters is since the magnetic moments are aligned with J it is now uh, the scalar product with the, of the magnetic field with J So, we, so in the vector model, we calculate the Zeeman energies in that way. But just to mention that if you don't like the vector model and the assumption of rapid precession, just take this matrix element. It's exactly the same result. But in other words, I give you an intuitive picture what is inside those matrix elements. OK, so let's evaluate that. Factor out the Bohr magneton. And uh, we have J square taking one of each bracket. And now uh, the magnetic moment, assuming that the G factor of the spin is 2, the magnetic moment is the Bohr magneton times L, the G factor of L is 1, plus S but the G factor of S is 2. So this is now the magnetic moment accounting for the two different G factors we project it on the J axis. And the second bracket, B dot J, becomes the value of the magnetic field. We assume the magnetic field points in the Z direction, so therefore it is the Z component of the total angular momentum. So let me collect the simple terms. Now, L plus 2S can be written, because L plus S is J, can be written as J plus S. So now we have the product of J with J. Which gives us j squared. And then we need the product of s and j. And as usual, we can get an expression for that by using the summation of angular momenta. And if we square it, on the right hand side, we have the scalar product of j and s. But we have now the scalar product of J and S expressed by L square J square S square. J square plus S square 
minus L square divided by J square. Okay, so now we're just one line away from the final result. J's, JZ is a good quantum number. It's MJ, the projection of the total angular momentum on the z-axis. And on and the bracket here is now the result, the famous result for the Lundy G factor. So we have j squared over j squared, which gives us 1. And then I simply put in the quantum numbers for j squared, s squared, and l squared, which is j times j plus 1 plus s times s plus 1 minus l times l plus 1. And we divide by 2 times j times j plus 1. So therefore, the same structure in a magnetic field is the Bohr magneton times the magnetic field times the angular momentum in the j direction, but then we multiply with the g factor. If we don't have spin, these are two limiting, these are now limiting cases. If we do not have spin, then the only ingredient, the only contribution to angular momentum is orbital angular momentum, and we have a g factor of 1. So the Lundy g factor simply becomes gl. In the case we don't have angular momentum, and you can just evaluate this expression for l equals 0, you find indeed that the g factor is 2. But it can have different values depending on the uh, it depends on the atomic structure. Okay. So that's all I want to say about <coughs> fine structure in a magnetic field. The next step is now hyperfine structure. So we are adding one more vector to the game. So we add angular momentum of the nucleus. So now the game we play is not only L and S. We have I and B. So it's a game of the four vectors and eventually how they process around each other. And that gives rise to the structure uh, of hyperfine levels in an external magnetic field. We assume that L and S have coupled to J. So we have actually the coupling of J, I, but now we have an external quantization axis in Zeeman energy due to the external magnetic field. And of course, in hyperfine structure, we discussed that I and J, I and J are no longer conserved angular momenta because they couple to a total angular momentum, which is F. So our Hamiltonian is the sort of Hamiltonian without any uh, hyperfine and fine structure. Then we have the hyperfine coupling, which couples I and J with the product I dot J. And then we have an external magnetic field which couples to the magnetic moment uh, 
of the electron. And I mean, this may be a smaller term, but you can easily carry it with us. There's also a coupling with the magnetic moment of the nucleus. So in this case, because the hyperfine structure is smaller than the fine structure, I want to discuss both the weak field and the strong field case, because magnetic fields of a few hundred gauss may actually take into the high field limit. So I want to discuss both the low field and the high field limit. The low field limit implies that the Zeeman energies are much smaller than the hyperfine splittings. And uh, then the sort of way how we describe the system is that uh, J and I couple, so J, which is responsible for the magnetic moment, possesses around F, the total angular momentum, but then the total angular momentum possesses around the magnetic field. So in other words, you assume that the coupling between J and I is so strong and they couple to F, the magnetic field is not breaking up the coupling between J and I. J and I together form F, and this hyperfine state, its magnetic moment, possesses around B. So you have the sort of, this is sort of the picture, you have to get used to it. Uh, J possesses around F, and F possesses around the external magnetic field B0. But again, if you don't like the precession model, just calculate the quantum mechanical energy levels diagonalize the Hamiltonian, the answer is identical. Um, yes. So the same Hamiltonian couples to the magnetic field. And we have two contributions to the magnetic moment, the electron and the nucleus. And in the weak field limit, uh, we use a treatment which is almost completely analogous to the treatment uh, we use when we derive the Lully G factor. So in the weak field limit, We can treat the Seemann Hamiltonian perturbation theory, and it's exactly analogous when we added a weak magnetic field to the fine structure. So, in the vector model, we have the coupling of J and I to F. And uh, the relevant term in the Hamiltonian is we have the magnetic moment of the electron, which is proportional to J and it couples to B. So this relevant term, and this is fully analogous to what I did five or 10 minutes ago, has to be replaced due to the presence of the nuclear angular momentum, we have to project everything on the axis of the total angular momentum F. So therefore, the Seemann Hamiltonian It had the contribution of the to the magnetic moment due to the electron and due to the nucleus. This is proportional to J, but now we have to project it onto F. And similarly, 
the magnetic moment of the nucleus is proportional to I, but what matters is the projection on F. And since I factored out the Bohr magneton, uh, the magnetic moment of the nucleus is proportional to the nuclear magneton, I have to write, I have to account for the ratio. And what matters now is the projection of F on V naught. So therefore, collecting all the terms, we have the Bohr magneton, which is setting the scale of the interaction. The last term is the magnetic field, but the projection of F onto the magnetic field gives us the NF quantum number. And all the rest is called the G factor of the hyperfine structure. And the G factor of the hyperfine structure is Let me just simplify and neglect the small contribution. It's 1,000 times smaller of the uh, nuclear magnetic moment. But if you want, you can easily include it. Uh, but with this approximation, the uh, G factor of the hyperfine structure is this. So we, it's proportional to the Lange G factor we just derived. And then using exactly the same thing, you have J dot F. You can express it now by the quantum numbers of F square, J square, and I square. You find the final result, what are the G factors of the hyperfine levels, of the hyperfine states? So this is the hyperfine structure of atoms in magnetic fields. Uh, let's immediately go to the high field limit. The High field limit means that the electronic Zeeman energy is much larger than the hyperfine coupling. And that means, well, <coughs> when we treat the problem, we have to do we have to take first, we, we always, when we treat the problem, we first take care of the big contributions to the Hamiltonian. We try to solve it if possible exactly. And then the weaker term can be any perturbative. So now we are in a situation that the Zeeman coupling is the big term and the hyperfine coupling is the weaker term. So in other words, what comes first now is the Zeeman energy. So we are not coupling the electronic angular momentum and the nuclear angular momentum to total angular momentum, because this coupling is weak. We rather say that the electronic and the nuclear angular momentum align with the magnetic field. We quantize along the direction of the magnetic field. And then later we add the hyperfine coupling in a perturbative way. So B naught is now quantizes J along the direction of the magnetic field. And therefore, we use as a good quantum number NJ, the projection of J on the external magnetic field axis. OK, so this takes care of J. J and NJ are good quantum numbers. What about I? 
dass der Nuklearmagnetik, dass der Nuklearangular Momentum in der Nuklearmagnetic Moment strongly coupled to the magnetic field? Well, the answer is yes, but the argument is a little bit more subtle. The direct coupling of the magnetic moment of the nucleus to the magnetic field may be weak. So also that may be smaller than the hyperfine interaction. So then you would say naively, well, uh, the, the nuclear angular momentum should not couple to the magnetic field. It should first be coupled to the hyperfine interaction. But and the hyperfine interaction is I dot J. However, J, which couples strongly to the magnetic field because it couples to the Bohr magneton, has already been coupled to the magnetic field. So therefore, the hyperfine interaction, which is I dot J, is now modified because J couples to the magnetic field which means we have to project it onto the magnetic field axis. So therefore, the nucleus now experiences an electronic magnetic moment or an electronic angular momentum, which has already been coupled to the z-axis. And therefore, the hyperfine interaction is also coupling the nuclear, uh, the nuclear angular momentum to the z-axis. So therefore, the result is that it is now this indirect coupling. You couple the electron angular momentum to the z-axis and the electron angular momentum couples the nuclear angular momentum to the z-axis. So we are now, this quantizes the nuclear angular momentum along the z-axis, which means that n sub i becomes a good kind of number. Anyway, maybe the result is even simpler than the explanation. Our Seemann Hamiltonian now simply means that we have an external magnetic field and the electron couples to the magnetic field. So what matters is the projection Mj. The same happens for the nuclear magnetic moment And now we have to add the hyperfine interaction, which was originally I dot J. But since I and J are projected on the z-axis, what is really left over are only Mi and Mg. I could have gotten this expression immediately by just telling you J and I no longer couple to F. This is destroyed by a strong magnetic field. And the good quantum numbers are J and I, and their projection Mj and Mi. And then just writing down the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in this basis would have immediately given me this result. But I wanted to give you sort of the more mechani mechanistic explanation of what's going on inside the atom and what leads to this result. Okay, I have discussed for you the two limiting cases, the weak field and the strong field case. But you can solve it also for intermediate fields. You simply have to do an exact diagonalization of the Hamiltonian which involves the hyperfine coupling. And the hyperfine coupling, if you want, can be diagonalized as eigenfunctions, where the quantum numbers are j, i, coupled to f, and the projection on of f, the magnetic quantum number is nf. 
but now we have the Zeeman Hamiltonian where everything is projected on the z-axis, so we have mj and mi. And uh, this Zeeman term is, can be diagonalized in a different basis, which is the basis of j, i, mj, and mi. So I've shown you uh, the weak field limit where we, as, where we simply assumed those quantum numbers and calculated this term perturbatively. And I've shown you the high field limit where we use those quantum numbers and calculated this field perturbatively. But in general, you just have to write down uh, this, you have to write down the matrix element of this Hamiltonian in whatever basis you choose. You can use the weak field basis this term is diagonal, this is off-diagonal, or you can use the strong field basis where this is the diagonal and this is off-diagonal and simply diagonalize your Hamiltonian. Find the wave function, find the eigenenergies. And since for cases where S is equals one half, it's only a two by two matrix which has to be diagonalized, you can do it analytically and this leads to the famous primary formula. So the solution is analytic for uh, yeah, j equals one half. And it's a beautiful example which you should solve in your homework assignment. Let me just sketch the solution. Uh, there is when you trans when you go from the weak field to the strong field limit, uh, the z component of the total angular momentum in one case is mf, in the other case it is mi plus mj. So when you go from one limit to the next. Uh, you connect only states where mi plus mj equals mf. So the structure of the general solution uh, is, can be explained by repulsion and anti-crossings of states with the same uh, MF kind of number. So let me sketch that. So let me show you the weak field, the strong field limit, and do a graphic interpolation. And uh, what I've chosen as an example is uh, the case of a two duplet S one half ground state. And a nuclear angular momentum of three half. And uh, these are and examples for that is sodium and rubidium 87. So at, this is magnetic field, at weak magnetic field or zero magnetic field, uh, the spin one half couples to the nuclear spin three half, and that gives two hyperfine states. 
f equals 1 and f equals 2. The splitting is given by the hyperfine constant A and the hyperfine interaction is A times H times I times S and the structure is such that the center of mass of the energy levels is preserved. So therefore one state is moved up by three quarter A, the other state is moved down by five quarter. And since f equals 1 has three components, f equals 2 has five components, the center of mass is preserved. We have calculated the g factor for those states. And uh, the g factor tells us what is the structure in weak magnetic fields. So this is the weak magnetic field solution. At high magnetic field, well, you know what you have at high magnetic field. You have a single electron which can be spin up and spin down. So if you have an electron which is spin up and spin down, uh, it pretty much is linear Zeeman shift for spin down and linear Zeeman shift for spin up. So therefore, the energy levels will, so this is sort of what we expect. So what will happen is that the energy levels uh, will evolve like this. So in other words, we have eight levels. We have the structure at weak magnetic fields. At high magnetic fields, of course, we also have eight levels, but they pretty much group into spin up of the electron, spin down of the electron. And then there is a smaller hyperfine structure on top of it, because now the nuclear spin can have various orientations. And I equals three half state has four orientations. So therefore, electrons spin up and electrons spin down will obtain four sublevels. And if you ask, how did I connect it? What I've connected, the quantum numbers are such that uh, what is here, the states are labeled by mi and ms, and here they're labeled by mf, but mf equals mi plus ms. So this is how you correlate the states in the high field case to the states in the low field case. So, yeah, I'm running out of time, but uh, here we have mj equals one half. Here we have the electron spin minus one half. And uh, the These four levels are now four different quantum numbers for the nuclear angular momentum, which are minus three half, minus one half, plus one half, and plus three half. And this is what I meant by avoided crossing. You at some point, I think, draw it yourself, put the quantum numbers on it, look at it, and you, you learn a lot by doing it. But what you realize also when you solve the Hamiltonian, that this structure can be explained like in the following way. You will always find you have sort of states which are stretched, where there is only one state which has uh, the maximum angular momentum these are called the stretch states. And then the other states, you always will find two states which have the same total MF. And those two states avoid each other. 
So we can say, I'm just pointing on two states, those two states, let's just assume they have the same MF, they undergo an avoided crossing. And that's exactly what you get out of the diagonalization of the two by two matrix. So this whole diagram can be understood by you have stretched states which form a one by one matrix. There is no recoupling taking place. And then you have three pairs of states. Um, you have three pairs of states which form two by two matrix. And in each pair, if you would now focus on it, you really sort of see the avoided crossing typical for a two by two matrix. Any questions about that? The next thing would be to go through some Pika questions and review atomic structure, including external magnetic fields. But we do that at the beginning of the next class. <coughs>